Yes, hello. I'm here today at the Ivaneva House with Christine Dixie, an artist from South Africa, whom we've had the great pleasure of working with uh, within uh, the last one and a half weeks and hosting at the Ivaneva House. Uh, Christine's work has regularly been exhibited in South Africa, the US and Europe. Uh, she's primarily a printmaker, but her art also finds expression through films and elaborate installations, such as the one you see behind me here at the Ibeliva House uh, today. Welcome, Christine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Christine, with your work, you challenge gender roles and the way in which they have been historically uh, conditioned by society, myths, and image making. How did you integrate feminist concerns uh, within the To Be King installation? So the one um, way that I did it was that I enact the Lasquez, the painter. And um, in one of the scenes, I paint um, a moustache onto myself with a paintbrush, not a makeup brush, but a paintbrush. Paint the moustache on, paint my heavy eyebrows on. And um, obviously... Here I am, a woman, long blonde hair, mm -hmm. and the, the juxtaposition of the moustache and the eyebrows um, is um, kind of an ironic reference to the fact that I am not Velasquez, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the, the one way that I kind of mark the fact that I'm a woman artist, um, playing the role of a male artist. Uh, Velasquez um, himself was very um, entranced uh, with Rubens, who mm -hmm. he completely admired. And uh, Rubens's um, paintings are in the background of the Las Meninas painting. Mm -hmm. So for my reenactment, I was thinking the one artist that I um, completely admire and would be my Rubens is William Kentridge. Mm -hmm. So in the background, I have two um, references to William Kentridge paintings, another male artist, obviously. Right. So here I am surrounded, in fact, by these male mm -hmm. artists. So that is a kind of ironic reference to the art uh, world where predominantly um, male artists have had more success than female artists. Right. The manifestation of the colonial history that is still evident in Makanda, um, the Eastern Cape City where you're from today, um, has compelled your uh, preoccupation with Europe's legacy in Africa. So how would you say does this To Be King installation fit into post-colonial context? Um, which creative means have you employed to express these issues? Um, so one of the things that I found uh, really interesting was that the Prado, where Las Meninas hangs, um, opened its doors to the public in 1820. Mm -hmm. And 1820 was the year in which my British ancestors from England arrived in the Eastern Cape and then made their way to Grahamstown, now Makanda. Mm -hmm. So it just seemed to me this strange um, uh, relationship about what was happening in these two very different parts of the world. In the installation, I use a space just outside of Makanda, mm -hmm. um, which is called Burnt Kroll. And Burnt Kroll was a tract of land which was um, first... Um, a, a kind of cattle, it was a space where cattle uh, were kept and owned by a, um, a Dutch settler called Piet Retief, who is infamous actually as being one of the voortrekkers, so they're kind of the first Dutch colonialists. Um, then in 1970, the tract of land was um, taken on by the military and was used as a shooting range. Mm -hmm. So this tract of land is what I kind of use as my way of negotiating a kind of space on the periphery 
um, that uh, has a, a lot of significant meaning and um, speaks to the kind of European center, which is uh, also in the video. Um, the other way that I think is uh, not, maybe not as uh, obvious, but throughout the video, there are a ship sails across the horizon line, mm -hmm. and that ship is the ship that carried goods but also slaves from one part of the world to another. So those two um, uh, ways are significant in the video. Your work has included in national and international collections, including, among others, the New York Public Library, the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art, the Standard Bank Gallery, the Johannesburg Art Gallery, the Durban Art Gallery, the Isiko National Museum of South Africa, and the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan Museum of Art. I know we had talked about the different perspectives and the just the position, uh, positions of various aspects of the exhibition, um, creating always new intersections and destabilizing narratives. As you have traveled um, to these many locations along with your art, how has your experience been altered by the location? How did that impact the art? How was your experience um, then perceived differently, the message perceived di differently by the audience? And um, what, for instance, were markedly different perceptions by the audience? And of course, in turn, how did that change your experience? When I uh, first showed this installation, it was in the Albany History Museum in Makanda, which was then Grahamstown mm -hmm. in, in, in 2014. And the Albany History Museum was set up as a, uh, a museum to honor the 1820 settlers, which is obviously now hugely problematic. Mm -hmm. the, the space that I um, used uh, to show the installation <coughs> uh, is like upstairs in the Albany History Museum, was upstairs in the Albany History Museum. And I became very aware of the, the gap the, the strangeness of trying to create this European mm -hmm. masterpiece right. in this very um, Eastern Cape, South African environment. So as you, you know, you come in from um, the street, which is a, a very uh, local African space, and then you suddenly in a museum, which is trying to create a European um, space. And the dislocation, in fact, became part of the meaning. I liked the fact that there was this dislocation. Mm -hmm. Also, what I discovered when I um, spoke to the students in particular was that they had no, well, very few of them actually um, had intimate knowledge of the Las Cuevas and Las Meninas. Mm -hmm. So that was a, they, they recognized the landscape. They recognized the South African landscape, right. which I had recreated. They also picked up on nuances um, that maybe a European arts audience wouldn't pick up on. They mm -hmm. refer specifically to South African um, myth and, yep. and, and history. Um, <clears throat> so that was something that I I had to kind of negotiate in that space. When I took it to to Venice and London, which were the first places where I showed it in Europe, it was like it had turned on its head. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, um, I was aware of the fact that I had taken on this complete icon. Something that I kind of knew, but I hadn't been really understood until I was in Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know that saying, 
fools go where angels fear to tread. I felt a little bit like that. Right? <laughs> so there I had to explain the South African context. Mm -hmm. um, and for example, um, in the video, there's this one character who stands in the doorway. He's wearing a t-shirt called Soti. Mm -hmm. And he walks into the space um, of, the, of the court. Now, in South Africa, no, most people know the reference to Soti. Do you know the reference to no, Soti? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, Soti is a colloquialism for, um, or short for, Soat Peel. And Soat Peel is a character that stands with his one foot in Africa and his other foot in Europe. And because his uh, penis is dangling down in between these two feet. <laughs> it is getting salty in the Atlantic Ocean. So soat peel refers to a character that is a liminal character between places. And that character in the painting, Nas Many Nas, is a liminal character because he's halfway in the door and halfway out the door. So I was referencing the fact that there is this liminal space that soti occupies. Now, in South Africa, I don't have to explain that. Right. But when I was in Europe, suddenly I have to explain what that means. Right. So it's just one example of how this interpretation shifts with, mm -hmm. with every different place that I go. You've had a very pro uh, prolific year so far. Uh, for instance, you have just opened an exhibition in March of 2022 uh, titled At Bathurst Street, Makanda. Uh, at the Gallery of Sarchi Chair at the University of Johannesburg. Moreover, you have opened an exhibition titled The Blueprint for the Disorder of Things in April 2022 at um, the Wits Art Museum. With Blueprint for the Disorder of Things, you again use texts uh, by Foucault. I believe this is a body of work which also continues the work you had started with um, your To Be King, work and with that um, installation. Um, what are those themes um, that you have started with To Be King and now continue to work with on this new exhibition? And how have you progressed um, your interrogation of these topics? Blueprint for the Disorder of Things um, began when we were in hard lockdown in mm -hmm. 2020 in South Africa. And because we were in hard lockdown, I had to work with um, things that were already in my space, which is why I went back to this text, which it always, which I had uh, made uh, copper plates from, mm -hmm. of. So I, I had those plates already and I wanted to do something. And here was an opportunity. I had to um, somehow find something that I could work with. Right. In To Be King, the artist figure that is a silhouette is made up of text from Las Meninas, mm -hmm. because Las Meninas. So it superimposes the artist Velasquez with the text of Las Meninas. And so there's a kind of uh, uh, something that is that comes together between text and image. Right. So the idea of text and image has also been something I've continued to be interested in. In Blueprint for the Disorder of Things, again, I wanted to find a way to disrupt text through image. I was very anxious um, when the pandemic started and I found that I'd read a passage and realize I hadn't taken anything in. I'd start at the top again and read it and I was almost in too much of a state of stress or anxiety to absorb what was going on. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to find a visual way to 
describe how I couldn't read, how nothing made sense anymore, because obviously language is about making sense of things. Right. So one of the ways I did this was through taking the text of Las Meninas and just embossing it, which means that you can't see it. Only through shadow can you actually read the text. Mm -hmm. The other way I did it was through um, overlaying prints with other prints and images so that the text almost becomes obscured. So the idea of disorder is becomes visually apparent. Right. The, the idea of not making sense of things, of disorder, as opposed to Foucault's the order of things was something I wanted to play with. The other way in which I continued a theme that ran through from To Be King to Blueprint for the Disorder of Things was the character of the princess. So the princess becomes a figure in Blueprint for the Disorder of Things who is a life-giving force. She is the character that holds a paintbrush, is, I suppose, a character that um, is creative. She is juxtaposed to a plague doctor who has medical uh, instruments coming out of its head and around its waist it has also these medical instruments and I suppose is like a sci scientific way of looking at the plague and of the pandemic. So these two characters became uh, juxtaposed and interact with each other um, in the ne this next body of work. So in those, those ways the themes through came through to the king into blueprint for the disorder of things. Um, again, I used a video as mm. a way of animating some of these characters, which is um, something that happened in to be king as well. To be king obviously is found in, in historicity. It does, however, also highlight uh, universal contemporary notions and ex existences. Uh, it reveals underlying social and cultural dynamics um, and so forth. Does it not? Uh, I think so. Um, I think one of the main concerns in To Be King, which is obviously a, could be a contemporary concern of everyone's, is the relationship of power. How do we... Um, how do we see the world? Through whose gaze do we see the world? Right. How are um, things prioritized? I mean, and that is very much um, a concern that runs through from history to the present day. The, the idea in To Be King um, is that the king controls the way we see the world. But who is king now? Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be Netflix. It could right. be um, Trump. It could be Elon Musk and Twitter. Mm -hmm. You know, so those, how, who's, who's controlling the way we look at the world? And I think that concern is, um, has been maybe embodied in the king in the past, but now maybe he has a multiplicity of ways of control and um, I think makes it a contemporary concern as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming here, for joining us at the Ibaliba House. It's been so amazing, really. It's been a wonderful, wonderful experience. Great. And thank you also for taking the time today to speak to me. No, it's been really, it's been a very rewarding